what I got to talk about today is something that I always found very interesting in several aspects, and uh, I try to follow the spiritist uh, way of discovering things. Kardec said, it's not because one spirit said something, it is true. You have to investigate, you have to look for different sources, you have to have this information coming from different places. So, it's been quite some time when I first heard about the last subject of this talk, which is the Indigo children, but I heard a lot about planetary migrations of spirits, and I tried to read about all of this. It's interesting how some people, they have the time to write pages and more pages about it and against it. <laughs> so I tried to read both cases, see who would make more sense. So everything that I'm going to present today is according to what I could grasp, what I could understand, what I could, the results of my investigation. Some of the people, they were way too, tra traveling way too far, other they were way too much against everything, just like everything else. So what I could filter is what I'm going to share with you guys today. Okay, that I find very interesting in this road. So it always starts with uh, group reincarnation or collective reincarnation. When a group of spirits, uh, just like could be 10 spirits, could be 100, could be 200 spirits, they come on a mission at the same time right now to the planet Earth. Okay? So, uh, Emmanuel on the book, uh, I, don't, I didn't see this book in English, so I'm translating the title in Portuguese, is A Caminho da Luz, so I put on the path to the light or heading to the light, stuff like this. It's a great book that uh, Emmanuel dictated through uh, Chico Xavier, Chico Xavier, that basically tells a history of the world from a spiritist perspective. Why some things happen, it explains uh, why Rome got so powerful or what the Egyptians were doing there from a spiritist point of view. So, on that book, it explains, just like the individuals, the collectivity of people also return to the world through the path of reincarnation. So, Several times we have to have a lot of people who coming together at the same time. So let me ask you something to you guys. Is there anybody here that doesn't believe in reincarnation? <laughs> exactly. We are all we are preaching to the right audience, right? Yeah. So this is second. Uh, Joan said that somebody left to the light on if you have a folks back in. It's a beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Is it you? Yeah. We would hate to see you go back to mm -hmm. your car and you have no better. Mm -hmm. so I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, then I'm going to change my question. Do we accomplish all our different corporeal existence upon this earth? In other words, are we, do we always born and reborn here on earth? So, that's the question 172 on the Spirits book which is not so long ago we read this question here on our study that we do every Tuesday. So the, the answer in bold is not all of them for those existences take place in many different worlds. So it always starts with we don't born and reborn on earth only. Can the spirits come to this world, world for the first time after being incarnated in other worlds? Yes, just as you may go into other ones. All the worlds of the universe are united by the bonds of solidarity, that which is not accomplished in one of them, is accomplished in another. So in other words, were we born here on Earth first? No. If you if we read all the questions that come after 172, all the way to 182, I think, you're going to see that the spirit of truth basically tells us that it's very rare that a spirit is going to reincarnate on Earth for the first time, like uh, it's going to be his first reincarnation. Usually we came from other worlds. And we're going to continue our progress on Earth while Earth is the correct school for us to evolve. Once we reach a certain point, we can look for a different school, which means we could go to a different world. Or, if Earth becomes a school that is so hard for us to be on it, we're going to go to another one that is more, more suitable to our uh, evol evolutionary state. Okay, so the group reincarnation or reincarnating uh, collective uh, of, of souls is not something that 
it's always uh, for, from this spiritism only. So, uh, the definition for this would be the group of spirits that live together on certain place and time and they reincarnate all together. Same family. We, if we read some of the books from uh, Andrea Luis, we see that uh, the grandfather reincarnates as, you know, the grandchild that reincarnates again. And so the same family, they keep trying to solve their issues, reincarnating on the same uh, nucleus, right? And uh, some other examples. Uh, recently we had a talk about Francis of Assisi, and uh, the indication is that when he reincarnated on Earth, it's believed that he was reincarnation of uh, John the Evangelist. Uh, 200 other spirits came with him to help him all that mission. So that's another example of a collective. And there are other books. Uh, there is one called uh, We Are One Another, where someone explains all the connections that one family has with another family that lived like uh, eight, 80 years before. It has nothing to do with spiritism. And there are several other books related to reincarnation. But this one is interesting because it talks exactly about a group of spirits reincarnating together. So, uh, some examples on Earth. If you guys remember the Phoenicians, when you learn in school, they were great sailors. They would sail the Atlantic, they would go everywhere. And uh, we were talking about before, uh, like 2,000 years ago, before we had you know any navigation system, GPS that we have today, they made their way to Greenland, to Iceland. So the Phoenicians really, they owned the sea. And that, where, uh, Phoenicia used to be, that's where uh, Lebanon is nowadays. And uh, we find a lot of uh, correlation between what the Phoenicians used to do and the Portuguese and the Spanish. So it's believed, according to Emmanuel, on that same book, that the Phoenicians reincarnated later, all, all of them together, or a big group of them, on the Iberia, mostly in Spain and Portugal. And you see what the Portuguese accomplished. As uh, sailors, they went all the way from Portugal, the first Europeans to reach Japan, for instance, or to reach India, and establish the commerce uh, through the uh, through the Cape in Africa, right? And then in uh, in Greece, you had the Spartans; they would love the war, and the Athenians; they would love the art, philosophy. So what Emmanuel tells us is that the Athenians they came back to France during all the illumination, during all the period of lights in France, basically the same spirits, they already had something similar with, when they were in Athens. Why the Spartans, they reincarnated mostly in Prussia, which is was one of the states of the old uh, German Empire or Germany itself, and a lot of them in Russia as well, where you can identify mainly, if we talk about uh, almost a century ago, the warrior spirit that you would find in all those countries. The Romans, with uh, being able to establish a great uh, uh, infrastructure in all their colonies, but still dominate all of them, but at the same time developing some structure in them, they, after Rome, went all the way down. That spirit, they could also be helpful somewhere else, so they put them in one island, isolated from the continent, and they found their place in Great Britain, which became the biggest empire ever that this uh, world ever saw. And it is believed also that some of those, they still carry the eagle over the ocean, and they may be here now. Exactly. Exactly. Even the symbol is exactly the same. They still keep the eagle. So, uh, I mean, the bird, <laughs> not the eagle. You know? Even the bird. So, uh, <laughs> this uh, this came to us through Emmanuel on the book uh, The Way to the Life. So, here we're talking about a group of people that were incarnated on Earth coming back on Earth. That's very simple, right? Mm -hmm. So, a lot of us, we could be part of this. We uh, like we had our plan, we were sent down to to Brazil, some of us, some, uh, to other places, to Portugal, and the Phoenicians, we get our boat, which today is the airplane, and we come back here to Rome. You know, <laughs> so, we insist on being here. So, when we talk about the spiritual migrations, if we compare a little bit with the migrations that we have here on Earth, when some people from a certain area, from certain, a certain country, they go to, uh, to other place, there's a reason for them to do that. A lot of them, they are running away from misery and trying to find a better place. It's going to happen. 
All the ones, no. They want everything. You know, so when you see like what the Europeans did when they uh, came to the Americas or when they went to Africa or when China spread out throughout Asia, and you see uh, James Gunn, what these guys want, they wanted expansion, right? But somehow God allows that to happen. There's a reason. You know, uh, it's on the Bible, but this can this candle is necessary. You know, poor of the person that caused this candle, but sometimes maybe uh, maybe necessary. So, not always uh, like the means to do things may be not ideal, but the results there are, there there may be good results when this type of thing happen. So, if we go all the way from the questions one seventy two to uh, one hundred eighty eight, we're gonna be told that we did not always reincarnate on Earth. So here I'm talking about the Spirit's book, basically uh, supporting this idea that we may have lived, or we certainly lived in other worlds before coming here to Earth. Okay? Why, why exactly does it matter? For us to prepare to understand some of the things that are happening now. We're going to look what happened a few thousand years ago. Okay? So, when you go to a school, you go to learn. When you put someone that is extremely smart, but not necessarily uh, on the advanced grades that that school needs, you're going to need to put that person, going to need you, uh, I don't remember uh, how we say in English, but that person going to need you to go to that grade again. You know, until you learn all the lessons, right? So, they can evolve on their progress. So, we are not, on spirit the only ones who believed that we came from other planets, you know, somehow. Uh, there's this book called The Chariot of Gods that they investigate. Uh, in Portuguese, it would be called Eros Deuses Astronautas. Mm -hmm. That they investigate some uh, writings on uh, rocks and things like this that suggest that, okay, what does this mean here? Why? We have something that really looks like an astronaut. <laughs> and uh, believe that was dropped maybe you know four uh, or uh, forty thousand years ago. There are several theories. Once this book came out, a lot of people they uh, is from Carl Sagan. A lot of people looked and said, "No, this is all wrong. This is all right." There was a lot of discussion, but I don't think that that's impossible. That someone was drawing something like this. The difference is. On this boat, they believe that someone came actually on a starship, landed, and did everything here. Here in Spiritism, we know that you don't necessarily need to have the matter to come here. It's much, much simpler. It makes much more sense that those spirits, they needed to reincarnate on Earth. This is based on a reflection of what they thought it could be dreamy, but could be simply the remembering what they had before. And that originated, if you, uh, if you look it up, there is even the uh, ancient astronaut hypo hypothesis. So it's about that. So uh, the primitive people, they would react differently according to this. Uh, in Egypt, they really believe that they, uh, during some time, the pharaohs, they were godlike, they were half divine and half human. Uh, they believe that the, the, the pharaohs could actually be divine, meaning they would come from, you know, from heaven to earth or from, uh, you know, from the sky to earth to actually be able to rule everything. Okay, this picture specifically is a petroglyphs from a bell Camonica in Italy. So it's uh, something that they did in the stone. Right. right. Yes, Petra. Yeah. Okay, and uh, some of you may have heard the uh, the idea of spiritual like migration that you know not necessarily they are from. Uh, it's religious only. Have you ever heard of uh, Scientology? So, if you ever saw Tom Cruise or, you know, uh, some of these guys, they really loud the, the voice about Scientology a lot. I don't know much about it. I actually I watched South Park. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, I got a lot of head start about that. And uh, the way they put it, you can laugh a lot, you know? Just like they do with everything else, they can destroy everything, you know? So, I, I tried to read, uh, after I saw that, I, okay, let me see, not the soft part side, but what the actual people say about it. So, uh, what they tell, how it all started, uh, Scientology is a uh, religion actually based on uh, science fiction. So, what they say is that there, there is a galactic confederacy, and there was a ruler 
called the Zenon, a dictator, and he expelled a lot of uh, spirits 75 million ago, and they are jail, they are prison on Earth. So all those spirits, they were sent to, a volcano, to the volcanoes here on Earth. How they came? They came on DC-8 air, uh, airplanes that look like DC-8 airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they really tell those things on... <laughs> 75 million years ago? 75 million years ago. Came by plane? <laughs> Not exactly how those airplanes, but it looks like airplanes because, you know, we only invented the airplanes much, much later, you know. But there were spirits that were already old enough. They were living someplace else, but they did things wrong that, you know, Zeno, the ruler, sent them to exile on Earth, you know. And when they came to the volcanoes, they got uh, the Fetans, which are uh, matter-like type of things, and your mission on Earth is to be a good person that you can get rid of the Fetans. Which I found when I read more about it, it's very similar to karma. The difference is that here they put as physical things on your spirit, you have to get rid of. You know, basically, when I compare to what we, uh, so more is just like getting rid of. Pretty much. Exactly, exactly. So, as, as you can see, they're not like completely wrong, but that's the way they like to see those things. We see things differently, but there's a, there are a lot of common things. And my idea here is just to show that we are not the only ones or the spiritists that believe that we came from other places. So, uh, yesterday we were trying to find the moon using the, the Google Sky Map, and then uh, we found Venus, and right beside Venus we could see Capella. What is Capella? Capella is uh, not one, but actually two giant stars surrounded by two other smaller stars that gravitate around Capella. This is the subject of a lot of discussions since when Emmanuel first said a lot of people from Earth are from Capella. And then uh, Edgar Ramon wrote a book, Exiled from uh, Capella, and that came out and there's a lot of discussion. There are a lot of people showing, in Capella you cannot have light uh, the way we have here. So let's talk a little bit about this. So Capella is the Alpha Origai. So Origai is that system of four stars up there, and then uh, Alpha is the, the biggest one on the system of Origai. Uh, Capella is 42 light years away from Earth, which means, you know, uh, I've never saw the light from Capella because I'm not 42 years old yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and according to Emmanuel, what he tells us is that the light in some degree is similar to what we have here. Again, it's not they have humans there. They have some type of light that can accommodate spirits that those spirits can also uh, come here to Earth. So it's a system formed by two giant stars. One nine and the other one is 12 times bigger than the sun. So they're huge. Right? And, uh, uh, and a few other smaller stars around that. And uh, the spiritists, according to what we read about Emmanuel, we believe or Emmanuel tells us that Capella evolved to a certain level that it was hard for them to keep some spirits that were stopping that evolution from, happen mm -hmm. from happening. And uh, what happened then? The planet is no longer vibrating on a certain frequency that accepts people vibrating on a completely different frequency. So what happened? Next is that, according to Emmanuel, Capella reached a certain period that was the end of certain evolution, basically, from a planet of expiation becoming a planet of regeneration. That's how we can interpret that. It's much bigger than that, of course, but that's the closer we can get to this. So those spirits that were not on that level anymore, they will need to go to other school to continue their evolution. And it looks like Jesus accepted them, said, okay, here on earth, we are with, uh, the humanity is on the very beginning. So I do accept those spirits that are going to born here on earth, on the body of the humans here on earth. And even though they are not morally evolved, they're going to help develop those spirits while they're going to have the chance 
to more evolve and who knows even come back to Capella if that's what they want if that's what is necessary right so the way uh, they see it is that they were sent the dark face of earth without being able to see the light of Capella for centuries and uh, when they came to earth what was happening was that uh, we all know about the genetic mutations uh, is the mental uh, mental theories that that's how life evolved basically you have uh, a cell that's going to keep reproducing how are you going to have something different you have to have a mutation and you keep mutating and that's how you have all the different forms of lives uh, what spiritism comes to the point there is not denying it's basically it's like, yeah it all happens but it has someone on the spiritual road guiding those mutations to happen it's not by chance you know so there's a reason for this to happen so when those people from capella they started coming to earth the spiritists they were still experimenting a lot with humanity which means they were trying some mutations these guys here they came and what happened was that it's just like the software adapting to the hardware right which means that those spirits they also help changing the body of the humans and they created new races and those races they were uh, called the Adamic races coming from Adam they came from a time where we were still or, or the spirit this spirituality was was still experimenting so there was still a lot of room for these changes so if you want to learn more about Capel there is this book from uh, Edgar Armand is in Portuguese. I didn't see a translated in English, so there is a good chance for us to translate it. Yes. Um, the other thing I was going to say when you talk about the pharaoh, pharaohs is that um, at that time, um, you know, all the mathematics and everything they knew, it was because they came from Bay Area, right. and that's why they were seen as gods because they have these, you know, enormous knowledge that nobody on earth. Had at the time. Not, not at the time. So, I just yeah, you know. no, I agree. And we're gonna talk about the different uh, groups that came, and specifically what was the contribution from the people that incarnated in Egypt, mm -hmm. just like that. Okay. So according to the book, uh, these spirits they were way more intelligent than the the people that we already had on Earth, or we were based on the Homo erectus. You know, we were big, uh, barely getting together as uh, a primitive society when, when this came. So they would have the chance to develop, to help develop these people while they would have their chance also to morally evolve. So there were uh, four groups of migrations from Capella. Why am I telling this? We're going to understand some of the things that are happening today and some of the things that we see today. Uh, the first group that we're going to talk about were exactly the Egyptians. So, this group came, and among all the groups from Capella, these were the ones that has less debit, comparing to the other ones, not compared to the people that stayed in Capella. They still had something to As you can see, the Egyptians, they were extremely evolved in a lot of things. We still don't know how they built the pyramids. No, don't tell me no. No, we don't. How they did it. We know how to do it now. We don't know how they did it back then. We cannot read their hieroglyphs, what they wrote. We can try to make some sense of it and uh, we can almost be sure of what is in there but there's still room for doubt in all of this yes. these were the ones that uh they were extremely obsessed about death if you see most of their monuments they are related to death they always uh if you read more about it when someone died it was really a big ritual and you would leave your life preparing to die and then it's me. They were really hoping that after dying, they would go back to Capella, right? So, they had a really higher notion of spirituality and divine power. They didn't have one God, but they knew that the gods, they had a lot of power. So, someone invisible had a, a lot of power. To the point that they confused that, believing that the pharaohs, knowing everything that they knew, they, could, they only could be semi-gods, you know? Are semi gods. So, once uh, they reach it, uh, once here on earth, 
here's the point that all those debts were paid enough. Those spirits were gradually returning to Capella. And again, they were not good people. If you read out on the Bible, for instance, what they were doing to the Jews when uh, uh, Joseph went, or Jacob went to the Egypt was accepted, but then they enslaved, uh, they enslaved the Jews for you know a long time until Moses came. Okay, they were morally still fixing some things, but they were extremely involved on uh, intelligence, on mathematics and astronomy and a lot of those things. So, as they were paying their debts, they also return, they start returning to Capella. There's not a single trace from the people from Egypt. That area now, you have Arabs, you have Arabs people, you don't have the people that actually, if you try to find the traces where you see on the paintings, on the hieroglyphs, everything that you see, on the pyramids, you don't find traces from that people. They are gradually being replaced by other people in that same region. So, what we believe in Spiritism is that these folks, they already returned to Capella, but not without leaving their legacy. And the monumental pyramids, the impressive, both from the inside and the outside. Not only when you see that thing makes you wonder how they do that, as you go inside and see all the tunnels and everything that you have on the walls, or if you still don't understand, but they already done their part, so they are done. They are completely gone. They are probably back in, in Capella. Then the second group we can barely read here, but is the ancient India. India was the very first civilization that had uh, a higher notion of spirituality. A lot of the philosophy, a lot of the religions, has a lot in common with old beliefs from. The Indians. So, a lot of their ideas were the basis to a lot of other religions. The concept of divinity, reincarnation, ancestor, they were real. It's not something that you believe in. It's something that on their minds, it's something true. Something that really happens. was part of their daily lives. What we, we do today, for a lot of people, oh, do you believe in those things? For us, it's reality. It's not that we believe in those things. It's just like we know that those things are like this. It was like them we were talking about maybe 6,000 years ago. And uh, a lot of people that we believe they came from Capella, maybe not as excited, but actually to help those excited to establish on earth what they were supposed to do to evolve these people here. It's the only thing that can explain you receiving, for instance, Siddhartha, Gautama, Buddha, and uh, Krishna, and several other masters. They came to India first. They didn't come to uh, to Palestine. They didn't come to other places. The first place to receive several of those uh, big masters or the Mahatmas were uh, they were on India. Okay, so Mahatma Gandhi, more recently, of course, Sai Baba, more recently as well. A lot of the language from the uh, from the Western world they came from the Sanskrit, which was the written language developed by the people in India. If you compare. What you had before that, basically you had the hieroglyphs and the, what you have today to the Sanskrit, what the Latin written and uh, all the other, they seem they look much more like Sanskrit than it looks to uh, other languages. But okay, they had all this spirituality. Does that mean that they were good? They had nothing to fix? Not quite, right? But they would be there. They wouldn't be sent down here, right? And uh, let's say down here on earth. So there is a however. Even though they had all that huge notion, they were still bad. What was their problem? They were way too proud. And uh, they did not even mix with the native people here on Earth. They created the microcontent of India, they stayed there, and they established some of the things that were an abomination there that even caused them to be sent out. They brought here, which is the regime of the castes. And they still believe that, you know, you could really be born on a caste and you'll be superior than other human beings that were other ones. And that's the reason why Egyptians are gone. You still have a billion and a half Indians here on Earth still trying to evolve. Not only, I'm not saying that everybody that is in India is from Capella. India is just like any country here on earth that can be a great school for any spirit to learn. The basis of the Indian society, if we go back to uh, thousands of years ago that we had the caste, they are still today 
We believe that this was implemented by these people that came from Capella, and some of them, a lot of them maybe, they're still here, they're still supporting that regime of the castes, which is weird because they always believed in reincarnation. It's not something that uh, they started to believe. It was a reality for most of the people in India and uh, on the Hinduism and everything. But they ignore the idea that if you are on a caste that you are humiliating the other caste, where do you think you're going to go in the next incarnation so you can find a balance? You're going to be the humiliated one, right? So they ignore that, and so they keep this, uh, doing this, you know, but someday, just like us, we hope to get out of this surf of repeating the same, the same mistakes over and over, right? Third group, Mediterranean and Indo-Europe. So when you uh, analyze the migration of the people, when uh, people say, okay, how the men reached Europe, uh, how they became so white, let's say, on the northern, uh, on the very north of Europe, and things like this. So this is the group, one more group that came also from Capella. And this was the, among of them, the most rebellious one, uh, the most uh, warriors, and things like this. They did not care at all about religio uh, religiosity and spirituality. This group started in Persia and migrated all the way everywhere in Europe. Depending on how much they mixed to the humans that were already here, you have some of the differences on, uh, on their races there. So they, among the four groups that came, those were the only ones who actually blend and mix and were responsible to create several new races here on Earth. And even, um, even though they were not exactly good people, they were not as proud as the other three groups or the other two groups. The first group of Capella that uh, had some spir spirituality were the Celtics uh, in uh, Southern Ireland, right? And uh, in Britain. And uh, this was a group that developed all the white races, as I mentioned. Uh, you can separate it in two groups. The Nordic Germanic slaves, they're more compared to the Spartans, that they were focusing on the military development. They brought this. Uh, you see how superior the Spartans were on the military. And you had the Latins, Iberians, Franks, and Greeks focus on science and social developments. You needed to have very different to blend and one uh, help fixing the other ones. And finally, you got the Hebrews. The Hebrews. That was the most evolved group that reincarnated on earth from Capella with regards to religiosity. They had a deep sense of the existence of other worlds and mainly that there was one God. But among all of them, they were the proudest, the most proud, <laughs> everything that we can say, one. They really did not like the idea of being expelled from paradise from Capella and being sent down to this earth and even worse to blend with others a lot of them that's what they still think today I'm not saying that all the Jews are like this no but you can find a lot of people among the Jewish community that they really believe still that they should not mix with non-Jews right not saying anything here that that wouldn't be so they are Patriarch, let's say the one that really started uh, the religion of them, Moses, where where was he educated? In Egypt, right? So God allowed him to be saved, be sent to Egypt, be educated to be a pharaoh, right? So he had all the, this knowledge to prepare him for the big mission, which was to guide this group of Capella that would have a huge impact in all the world, okay? But so as part of his preparation, he was sent to Egypt. He was the one that received the Ten Commandments. That if you read that this day, it's very basic. All the uh, all the laws there, they should be based on this. Basically, I shall not kill. It's so simple. It doesn't say no. But if no, there's no if. It says you should not kill, and that's it, right? So. The notion that they have, that they write on the Bible, that they believe that uh, their uh, prophets were seeing visions that were being sent to him, it makes a lot of sense that what they were basically doing is kind of remembering 
what they had from the other roads. The road that became so perfect that was considered by them as paradise. And several of those spirits was, were considered the fallen angels. Several of those spirits, they were feeling like they were expelled from paradise. So they even put a name on them. They put Adam and Eve. If you try to read li literally the weights on the Bible, you have Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, one kills the other, and then the one that is there marries someone else. Well, marries who? Uh, yeah, that's some of my questions. <laughs> exactly. And you find people that try to explain that, and I still think, sure, there's, there are more important things to think about because that's, I really don't think that that's important because the way we can see this is basically that's the way they were remembering where they were coming from, from Capella. And if you do everything right, you're going to go back to paradise. Otherwise, you're going to be sent to hell, which means you're going to stay here. It's as simple as that, right? So, the Hebrews, they were the, the only one that, that came, or the first one to come with the idea that there is one God. Even though they believed that they had one God for them. <laughs> you know, and that the God for the Hebrews were stronger than the gods from everybody else, but they had only one God. But that idea was enough on the beginning to expand, to become the universal idea that there is only one God, which they still believe today. Because they were so proud, again, they did not want to blend with us, the, the, the savages. Which caused them, okay, how are they going to pay these debits? They're going to have to go to challenges. You know, that's the people that, as you can see, they suffered a lot. If you go back to Egypt, and then everything else that came after that, when Jesus uh, came to, uh, to Galilee and to Israel, they were under the, uh, the domination of Rome. Seventy years later, Rome destroyed completely what was the rest of the state of Israel. So, and they still lived until now they have their own state. But there was always Jews from the Jew race everywhere. So they endured those challenges, but they can be managed strong enough to keep their uh, their uh, singularity. So because of their stubbornness, they're still evolving, and they're going to still be here, reincarnated on Earth, until what they have to clean up or the debt they have to pay is completely paid off, and so they can do like the Egyptians and go back to Capella. That's what they really want to do. So. Are there some exiles that already returned to Capella? According to Emmanuel, yes, all the Egyptians, all gone. And uh, I read a book that I found very interesting. I didn't see a translation in English. It's this book called uh, Crepusculum dos Deuses. So it's also called, in English, it will be The Twilight of the Gods. It's by this writer called uh, Robson Pinheiro. And it's, it's very interesting. Basically, the book tells the history of the people in Capella investigating what happened to their folks, to their uh, uh, relatives that were sent to Earth, and they come to Earth to see if they can already rescue some of them. The guy from the book, he doesn't say it is true, he doesn't say it is fiction, but it's a very interesting story. Robson Pinheiro is a author of spiritualist books, he is a medium, not exactly very accepted completely by the uh, spiritist community, because he also looks on other things other than the way we look uh, the Kardec way. He writes about Umbanda, he mixes both things. So not always, it's going to be hard for, for you to see a Hudson Pinheiro book in here. But when I saw this book and I read the back, I found that very interesting. I look like no one's looking, no one's watching. I'm going to read this. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's not very interesting to, to read. Okay, so the same way as we saw people coming to Earth, we also go to other places. So, on the book of uh, Genesis, the very end, basically, Alan Kardec tells us that Earth is going through a period where we're going to go to something similar that Capella did. We're going to change our stage uh, from a road of expiation to the road to a planet of regeneration. And the spirits that are not, no longer compatible to Earth, they're going to find another school. They're going to bring all the development that they have here on Earth to the other place to help evolve these other places. So we may have another Adam and Eve someplace else, right? So the same destination as the people from Capella. They should go to other planets and learn fundamentals that they could not do while they were here on Earth. It's going to be their turn to teach also and learn, right? Okay, so now I'm going to 
talk about something that's happening uh, right now. There was this book that I read uh, that we read on the book club uh, from uh, Emmanuel, also through uh, Chico Xavier, Renuncia, Renunciation. And uh, the main character on that book is called Alcyone. And I, I think I know why he decided to, <coughs> to put this name. When you read this book, you're reading and on the very beginning, like on uh, the third page or so, the protagonist, Alcyone, uh, she's watching the sunset of the three suns around the planet where she is when she decides to come to Earth to help her soulmates or the spirit that was very dear to her. So, what is Alcyone? Alcyone is a star from a constellation of the Pleiades. I don't know if I can probably pronounce that in English, but here, Pleiades or Pleiades. Our solar system, we know that we have Earth and we have the Moon revolving around Earth while we revolve around the Sun, while the Sun revolves around or the Sun moves as well, right? So, if we see this video here, This is more like it, you know, like, the sun is also moving. The speed of the sun is moving, and this video says that it's 70,000 kilometers per hour, someplace else is 584 miles per hour. But basically to show that the sun is moving, we are moving around the sun. Okay? Thanks, Weimar, for the video. And even this video is highly contested because some people say that basically they move, the, sun, the sun is moving around or uh, randomly. Others say that they're moving, the sun is moving through a specific uh, place. And what I could grasp that makes more sense is that yes, the sun is moving around that orbit, around Alcyone, which is also moving around the galaxy. So it takes over 200 million years to go around the whole galaxy. Why it takes 26,000 years for the sun to go around this star called Alcyone. So our sun gravitates around this other system, which is Alcyone. And the calculations that came from Edmund Harley, you guys know who he is, right? Uh, he named uh, even a comet after him, right? It takes some calculations 24, other calculations 26,000 years for our solar system to gravitate around Alcyone, which is also gravitate, gravitating around the galaxy. So Alcyone is a third size star, so much bigger than the Sun, and is believed to be the brightest star of, that we can see in the sky. So, if we see this picture here, that's a little bit like what, uh, <coughs> what I'm talking about here. Here's our solar system. Here is the system of Alcyone. So it takes 11,000 years to go this way, and then it stays for 2,000 years on this uh, circle of on this. Uh, how the name of this uh, is this uh, this bottom belt, and then we go back 11,000 years, and then we are back on the bottom belt which is uh, emanated by Alcyone. Divaldo Pereira Franco, on his talk about the Indigo children, he starts explaining this. So, Divaldo, he has a lot <laughs> to teach us always. But when I look outside spirits and to see what people talk about uh, Alcyone and things like this, you have a lot of people that has nothing to do with spiritism saying that they're receiving messages from the system of Alcyone. You have Edmund Harley saying that we are finally penetrating, or although I still don't they are penetrating the, uh, the bottom belt of Alcyone, but mainly what is happening is that we reach the peak where we receive more radiation, more photons, more emanation than ever before. In this period was between 1982 and 2012. 
Now we go to look into the spiritual way of this. Not only mercy radiation, but we also receive it, not only lights, but we receive a lot of spirits. We work close enough on the right position for these spirits to start coming to earth as well. So, the same way as the people from Capella, they helped us creating some of their races, we are talking about thousands, 6,000 years ago, these spirits coming from uh, Alcyone, they also have a mission here. They also have something to learn and something to teach here. And as one of the uh, their tasks, as they blend here, we're going to develop also the human body to the next level to when we become a planet of regeneration as well. That means, if you look at the past, we used to have way more hair, everybody, right? We have much less now. Maybe we had 12 fingers, I don't know, we <laughs> have five, but we still have the wisdom to hopefully we're going to get rid of this, right? I hope we're going to get rid of almost of our facial hair. I, I don't like it, that's why I, <laughs> I say that, you know? But new times to come. So, that's where, on the spirit team, we believe that those spirits... Okay, let's talk about a little bit about the indigo. The, uh, what are those kids? So, first of all, on the early, uh, on the 70s and maybe on the early 80s, th there was uh, this lady called Nancy Ann Tate, or Tate, I don't know exactly how to pronounce this, to pronounce this name. Uh, she had a condition called, she was synesthetic. She had synesthesia that for what I could understand, I'm not a specialist on this, uh, when she looked at people, she could see colors around these people. With other people, they could as a uh, pathology, as you know. And uh, for us, we don't see everyone that's diagnosticated with a pathology as their body is sick. Maybe they have a spiritual condition that we don't understand and we call them sick. That's how we put a lot of mediums as schizophrenic, right? A lot of uh, other introvert people as uh, autistics. So she was labeled as synesthetic because she could see colors around people. She started writing books about that. At the same time, uh, I was just talking in the beginning. I watched a movie with my son a, a few weeks ago uh, called E.T., the extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. And I thought that a lot, what I found interesting was that a lot of the kids on that movie, the teenagers on that movie or pre-teenagers, they are so different from the people from today, from the kids from today, from the teenagers from today, in a lot of things, not only, of course, the haircut or things like this, but what they would do back then and what these kids or the teenagers or early adults, what they do today, they're way too much different. Okay, I don't know how it was before I was born, 72, I forgot my previous reincarnations, of course, but for what I see, they are way too different. So, Nancy and Tate, she's like, I think it's fine certain children from that time, from the 80s, as the tool Amber Alert. So, some of you may receive that too. <laughs> and uh, so she started seeing the indigo, the indigo blue color on some of those kids. That's what she would see. So a little bit about the, uh, about the indigo. Indigo is actually a dye. Uh, it's not exactly the color, but in indigo became the synonyms of a color, the indigo blue. It was actually a dye that uh, came from some plants, and uh, the one that had the uh, is uh, organic. You have the whole composition, the, the chemical formula for this. And uh, the one that better developed, or you could find the better plants to develop the, that dye, was called indigo fera, indigo fera uh, which is a plant that is also a very good semiconductor. So it can transmit energy, but basically that dye was imported from India, from that plant, and the Greeks, they really liked that dye, the Romans really liked that dye, but a lot of the language, they had roots on Greek. So the same way as sometimes we label uh, coffee as, uh, oh, I have a uh, Xerox, as not the brand, but the coffee. So some uh, things, they become, uh, or, uh, they become the, the name for the things. The, the brand becomes the name for the things. 
the Greeks also called the Dai Indians. And the Greek word for Indians, for the Dai, was indigo, or indico, which on Latin became indigo. Okay, so that's where we got the name, because of the Dai. The color became blue, which is exactly the same color that we have on the indigo blue jeans. So, after that, there was this couple, uh, writers, they would write a lot of uh, self-help uh, books, husband and wife. They didn't care about indigo at all, but they noticed that there were children completely different than what they studied before in school and what they would see when they were as, as children. So they had unusual behaviors. And the parents didn't even know how to describe what this, those behaviors was. They didn't have words for that. That's when we care and in October they got together with uh, Nancy. They said, no, no, you don't, those kids, they don't have indigo blue. You are synesthetic. But, coincidentally or not, those children, they would identify as being different. She would also see the indigo aria around those kids. So this, uh, this couple started investigating, talking to you, uh, schools and to parents and try to see what those different kids they would have in common. So, starting in 1998, they started writing books with what they were finding uh, about these kids. And they decided to label those kids indigo children. So here, nothing to do with spiritism so far, nothing to do with Alcyone so far, right? So, we did not, on spiritism, we did not invent and we did not create the indigo term. Nancy and Tate is the one who created Big Care and Jan Tober, or Jan Tober, were the one to develop that for the society. So, what are the common characteristics of those kids that they were analyzing? They do not conform to common education methods, right? It's very hard to keep them paying attention on, on the class. They do not accept authority, rich authority, because I say so, is that it? That's it. Self-centered and strong guilt. And if you just tell something to them, then because I said so, does it make sense? They demand explanation. You know? Some kids, nowadays we know they don't do that, but a lot of them you have to explain why you're doing that. I'm a parent. You know? Not not saying that my, my son is illegal, but he may have illegal uh, friends. You know? So, they see things different than we do, and they see things different than other kids. That's why you have so many weirdos <laughs> nowadays. Just because they, they see the way they used to see back in Oceani, which is different than we here on Earth, you should see the, those things. They're curious, curious, questioners, investigators. They want to understand how things work, not necessarily build the way we used to build things, but they want to understand how things work. Innovators, very, very artistic. We're going to see some different groups on that. So, because I said so, really don't work with them. And uh, the other thing that I used to hear, from my mother, uh, wait until your father gets home, you know? <laughs> they, they don't care, you know? <laughs> that, that doesn't make sense to them, which I see happening a lot. I'm not saying it happens to all the kids, but we see this happening a lot, right? So, uh, I don't know if now they have better methods to identify those kids, but we never had in history a record of ADD and uh, ADHD kids as much as we have nowadays. So attention deficit and hyperactivity is way more today because of the sugar. I don't think so. I think the risk is much higher than before because we use with much more sugar than those kids nowadays do. And uh, we didn't have that many hyperactive as we see today. So are, are we saying that all the kids they are indigo? No, necessarily. We have pathologists as well. We have kids that may simply be hyperactive. But a lot of them, they are not pathologists. They act, they, we identify them as hyperactive or with attention deficit, but that's how their brain works. That doesn't mean they are pathological. So, you guys never heard of Ritalin? I guess that's how you pronounce that. You know? Ritalin, Ritalin in Portuguese. It's basically labeled the drug of obedience. Makes a lot of those kids basically be calm. They just calm down. It doesn't mean make them living kind of obedient. It doesn't make them sweet. You know, they basically don't obey you because they're drugged. And uh, a lot of the talks about indigo 
they, including uh, Divaldo, he says that stop that. And a lot of those stocks they were cut, and uh, even books they were cut out because they managed to stop retailing. Then I was looking there a lot of uh, lawsuits that the makers of retailing they sue people that say that for illegal stock. So there's a big war with what they call the big pharma because of retailing. So if there is all of this happening, there's something behind, you know, where there's smoke, there is fire, right? And the one thing that I have in common with them, I don't think this Indigo only, but they put that on the book, they can't stand waiting in line. You know? <laughs> I don't know anyone that really liked you waiting in line, but according to them, they really can't stand. Maybe? And even if they take a ring on you? I don't know. Well, is going to make them obedient, so yeah, they may do that. You know, they may wait in line, but basically can't stand waiting in line, right? So, those are some of the common characteristics. But for what we believe on spiritism, basically those kids, they are not simply here by chance. According to what Divaldo explained to us, those kids were sent to work. They are not extremely morally evolved. They're not great oh great they're, they're, they're good kids they came here to help us there is a mission for them here and the earth is also a house for them to to uh, evolve to you so those kids and i see that a lot out there they have a high notion of spirituality but not necessarily they are religious they don't follow a lot of them they call themselves non-denominational they don't put a label on what they believe but that doesn't mean that they don't believe on something sometimes they Try to explain, we don't understand exactly what they believe because some of the things just like, I'm not sure they can connect the dots, but that's the way they uh, they think. A lot of them with very high IQs. I know some kids that are uh, labeled as hyperactive, that they do math much faster than I would expect for a kid on that age, you know? And uh, all of them, you know, those things are, it's extremely easy for them. Of course, we all know that kids six, seven years old, they can teach us how to use our phone much better than we do. It's easy for them. According to what then I believe, they used to do much worse where they came from. <laughs> was much, you know, much more powerful the gadgets. And they still have to use our, you know, our iPads, okay, right? A lot of them, they make sense of the sixth sense, which means they communicate through telepathy. Even though we don't exactly understand and can prove that. So, I watched movies where some of the kids, they were demonstrating, uh, and movies not about spiritism, about indigo. They were showing how they could have kids communicate with each other through telepathy. I find that, scientifically speaking, I want to see more of this. But it's believed that those kids can do that. And uh, I find myself in trouble because when we go to the other side, that's how we communicate the spirits. So if we, if I believe that those spirits are coming, they may be a little bit more involved than some of us. They already they have that capability. Yes. So you said that the indigo name comes from the semi. There's the same conductor or whatever. The plant called indigo thera. Does that have to do with that? With telepathy? Okay. That's what I think. To, okay. You know, because semiconductors, that's basically what makes all yeah. our device here. And basically, mm -hmm. we are conducting energy, and the semiconductor is going to have to which right direction right. the energy is flowing here to make it, you know, right. Right. to make the button be on or off, Computers. you know? Okay. Exactly. So, I truly believe that so as yeah. when they saw the color blue, when they're related to that, yeah. th there's more blue than indigo only, but when they pick that, that thing, I also believe that, that when I read more, it said, no, indigo is also. I put semiconductor. I thought that there's a relationship mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. So they could be transmitting mm -hmm. to each other mm -hmm. through their blue aria. You know? I, I don't doubt that. No. Okay? No. It makes sense. Okay, so outside spiritism, back to uh, what they observe about those kids, a lot of them they are great at manipulating parents. We may all be victims <laughs> of that, where they say that they feel like they're superior even superior of their parents, you know? Hey, mom, I see a lot of them, you know, ro rose their eyes, you know? It's, it's my they die. <laughs> you know? And uh, they believe that they deserve to be here to be treated differently. There are four groups, you're gonna see. Not all the indigos, they are exactly like, like this. But self-affirming and uh, 
can be considered antisocial. That's why we see a lot of them here, you know, instead of around as we used to be. And uh, some of us we may call them that, but no, we we are not inside their brains. We cannot exactly tell that we understand exactly what goes with them. Okay, and they are preparing us for something even bigger that is coming. So. They also have depths, otherwise they wouldn't need to be born here, but they also have a mission here. They're also preparing us, physically speaking, our biotype to also receive what's going to come next, which is believed to be the crystal spirits. So I'm going to show to you guys a quick movie here. What is believed to be... Okay, look at this. He's four years old. Is the same boy that plays the violin? There's a boy, a um, Thai boy, who plays the violin. Yes. Since he was three years and you old. Find, and you find a lot of those. And you find uh, one kid in Mexico that when he was six years old, he was preaching the doctors. Think, okay, here's where you're wrong. It's not him, just this, this, you know? So, a lot of those, for what I could see, not only myself, but the people are pointing, are the indigo children. Extremely high IQ, all those different characteristics, but where did they learn all this? They know much more than we do. You know, we may take years to learn to play like this, no, they already knew, remember, it, and plays it. So, oh, this is from other life. Yes, even from other planet, <laughs> you know? And, when they make the case for what they're preparing us to, they're preparing us probably to. I know this may sound as you know coming from me, maybe. I'm not, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I believe that all of you guys already watched this kid here. I hope you can read. Think that. <laughs> of my, my preference, but basically I wanted to show how those kids are coming with that notion that if we read the questions 
723 of the o Consolador of Emmanuel, basically, we ask, can we eat meat? And he gives an answer, he's much, it looks like Emmanuel got mad with the question because of the way he puts this. Basically, he explains what this kid, explain why, you know? And he already born with that uh, type of thing, with that, well, he didn't forget any of the groups, the pigs, the fish, mm -hmm. the cow. Mm -hmm. Not only remembering those are already great, but he remembered all of those and saying those things. Mm -hmm. So, this kid was identified during my study as being a big example of the crystal children. Okay? So, how do you educate all those special kids? They cannot stay on the class, they are hyperactive and things like this. You guys probably seen around uh, Montessori schools out there, right? Uh, had no idea what they were. People say, no, it's a different method. Oh, let me see what how different they are. And uh, the uh, Waldorf teaching method. So, and basically, those are schools that you don't have a classroom and a teacher, something like this. It's a uh, continuation. You have kids of different ages on the same group. You learn, for instance, uh, this block is a thousand. This block is five hundred. This block is twenty-five. This block is, and that's how you learn math. It's mixing things. You have to. Uh, be creative on what you're doing. It's not like you have the teacher here teaching the kids, obeying there. They really, uh, we are talking about methods that were created in 1912, one by uh, Rudolf Steiner uh, in, uh, in Germany, even though he was from Austria, and Montessori School by Maria Montessori in Italy. So over a hundred years later, it's considered the ideal and if you look for Inigo children, Montessori is going to show that that's the ideal method to, kid, to teach several of those kids. And Rudolf Steiner, it's, Rudolf Steiner himself is already amazing. He believes that everybody is a spirit, and you're educating a spirit that is on earth. You're not educating kids. And uh, he believes in reincarnation and all those type of things, but interestingly enough, a lot of his method was adopted by a lot of Christian schools. They didn't apply it this reincarnation part, but uh, the way he teaches. The education is to be given at home, and the school complements the education. And uh, I read a lot about this part I found very interesting. I had friends that went to water schools that I had no idea what that was. And uh, during the symposium that we had last week, I went to this great uh, speaker that we have, Daniel Assisi, which happens to be spiritist and also an educator. So, so there was a me and I said, okay, can you talk about these two guys as a spiritist and an educa educator? And then he discussed how important it is to identify a kid that would actually perform better. It's not like this is great for everybody, but there are kids that would perform much better on this, uh, this type of, on this methodology. And you read a lot of scientists and teachers and uh, biologists that they came from this school. They did not learn the way we learn with tests. They learn doing things, they learn in nature. And then they go back and learn the formulas that you learn there. I found it amazing. I didn't know that there was something like this. So, and this Bibaldo said, on a food of Steiner education, you have to beware of the grandparents. <laughs> because the grandparents, they may screw up with everything. They, <laughs> they get mad that you're doing this thing they're gonna try to fix. So, <laughs> they say no. They may, they may be badly spoiled by the children you have on this education a limitation for accessing the technology because they want to keep your brain creative and your body active. If you stay on the iPad all the time, they're going to stop you from being creative. So basically what they're trying to say, okay, don't let the parents, okay, here's your iPad, you know, Something like this. So I'm going to uh, run here real quick through the four groups that were identified on the Indigos. So the four groups that uh, they came on were the humanists, artists, conceptual, and capitalists, just like we had a couple of four groups. The Indigo, they're trying to have four groups as well. The humanists, they're, that's the biggest uh, group. 95% of the Indigos are born under there from this group. Their motto is one road, one people. They have an inherited sense of justice. They can be, uh, if properly educated, can be good lawyers, diplomats. They are the young uh, prosecutors that we see. A lot of them in Brazil, a lot of the prosecutors going after the scandals and politicians, they are really young. They cannot corrupt these guys. You have women and young men leading companies and countries. So are the Inigos coming only now? No, now is the massive. But 
Even Steiner was believed to be an indigo that came to prepare the road to educate the indigos. The same as Maria Montessori. So a lot of the leaders today, they were actually preparing to come and receive the indigos. So one of them that is believed on this study is the president of this country. He came differently and he thinks differently and he showed uh, an American age that he could lead the biggest nation on earth. They're more casual and informal. They don't like tie and suits. I don't like, but either. And they they like to talk on the cell phone or through texting, not necessarily through their mouth. No? So they can be very good on communication. And uh, the biggest example of a human is that is indigo born during the indigos is Michael, is actually Mark Zuckerberg. You know. When you read it, uh, about the story, how he started things, not necessarily he was morally perfect, but he was a brilliant genius that at 21 he had almost a billion dollars and he created the social network that caused a revolution in, in Egypt, for instance, or the whole uh, Arab Spring was a lot from Facebook. You can't ignore Facebook. History is going to talk about Facebook, you know. Can and I say something? Yes. I don't know if you got a lot of this from the, uh, the book. Um, Transition, planetary transition, is that where he got from the value? Uh, because no, he no. talks about a lot about the difference between the indigo and crystal. The indigo, they like you said, they're very intellectual, you know, evolved, but they need a lot of discipline and direction, guidance to go to the right way. Because if they're let go on their own, sometimes they could be the radicals, they go to the wrong side. Exactly. Different than the crystals, they're already morally evolved. Exactly, and that's what, why they put also on that same bag uh, Steve Jobs. You know, if you watch the movie about Steve Jobs, you're going to say, he's a mess, you know, sometimes you look at I yeah. don't like this guy, but look what he did. Again, he's going to talk he about He still Apple. helped the world. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. It was part of his mission. And Zuckerberg, even though he started, people believe that he stole the idea from someone else, the way he implemented it. Nowadays, what he's doing, he's way more philanthropist than anything else. The like happened to Bill Gates, right? Yeah. So, the majority of the indigos, they are humanists. The second group is identified as artists. Uh, that's the name of the group. Not necessarily going to be performance, but they're considered artists because they're highly sensitive. This is a group that demands a lot of uh, attention. They can be over dramatic. This group, if bullied, can cause the serial killers. Because their sensitivity is much higher than, than the other people. You see people that they get frustrated too fast. They get uh, extremely angered too fast. They have a very high sensibility, but they are extremely smart. If properly educated, properly guided, they can be some geniuses on the arts, right? They change interest quickly, according to, uh, to Duval, who said, if he likes a piano, rent one, don't buy it, because it lasts a month. <laughs> they got to bring all, all, all of their toys, but because they want to learn how those things work. So they're multi-talented, they're curious, they break their toys, and uh, because they're high sensibility, they have way too many conflicts. So they may demand a special attention, so it doesn't come uh, uh, to hunt them and get the best out of them. Third group is the group of the uh, conceptualists, the think tank. What the other one, the ideas that they want to have, these are the ones who know how to put those ideas in place. They make sense of building things, they may be engineers of things, not of words. There are things that people are building today that I don't know how they do that, and I went to your school not too long ago. So they they didn't learn as this quick. I believe they remembered much faster than they learned. What what's their problem? They are addictive by nature. We have to keep them healthy. Have, uh, ideally, they should uh, have some kind of discipline, martial arts sports and things like this that would keep them healthy and disciplined and uh, they are really good on problem solving and the smallest group which is the last one which is much closer to the ones that are coming is the group called the capitalists the visionaries so they are and uh, you're gonna find a lot of videos about kids that were identified as indigos that they explain uh, their past lives even though they haven't been to any of uh, place on earth, they explain it all by past life and tell a lot about this. They have high mediumship, that's where Nivaldo identifies himself. 
he wished that people knew that 80 years ago, so he would be considered indigo. Mm -hmm. You know, but not crazy. But and then he makes a joke that okay, he's not an indigo child, but he's an indigo adult. <laughs> That's his uh, his joke about that. And we find that normal, you know, speaking, talking to your spirits. A lot of us here do that on a very young age. What's the problem with those kids? They say they talk to spirits and uh, they're quiet. Several times they are identified as autistics. So a lot of the kids identify nowadays as autistics. They may be indigo and they may be from this very select group because they want just to be quiet because their thoughts are running here. Mm -hmm. And you interrupt them, they go into rage, which is very similar to the reaction from the autistic kids. So maybe all what they need is someone that knows how to deal with them. That's why I believe we received Maria Montessori, we received Rudolf Steiner, and some other people that prepared the world to receive those kids because they can really change a lot of the world. So they believe that they came from this other place. A lot of them, they have intuitive that they came from other worlds. So, catalysts, they are special. We should welcome them and honor their desire for isolation today. Tomorrow, they will offer the solution to today's social problems of hunger, disease, poverty, and prejudice. That's what people study in the US, they believe. So, according to Jonah De Angelis, the biggest renovation on Earth is going to happen in 2052. So the Indigos, the massive immigration of Indigos already happened. It was between 82 and 2012. Preparing Earth to receive this other kiss crystal. Not the subject of this talk today. I really don't know much about this. But the Indigo there helped to prepare even our body to be able to host a spirit as that one. There's going to be a metal here. We're going to create a biotype that we will prepare to receive the crystal children arriving as missionaries. And that's when, according to uh, the Angelis, the rebel spirits should start coming out from Earth, should be migrating to other schools where they can continue their progress and help other progressing because Earth will no longer be the right school for them. They may have, may have you know, when you learn by love, you learn by pain, right? So the Indigo are preparing the way from them. We already have crystal among us. That's when I was supposed to show the second bit. But <laughs> yes, I do believe that we are already there. So if you want to learn more, of course, you can research this. This talk was basically uh, based on <coughs> this book here, Camino Luz, on the way to life, book by Emmanuel. This book called Excite from Capella, Edgar Armon. These two books here, we read on the book club here, okay? Uh, Indigo Children, a talk by Divaldo Pereira Franco, is one hour talk we have on YouTube with millions of views. Probably half of them were mine, but <laughs> a lot of them. And then books about Indigos by Nancy Van Topper, the one that I read a little bit more was this one, All About Indigos. She even has a website about that. And this couple, Lee Carroll, that actually Gloria Marco, that they were in Austin a couple of years ago here. And I am told her they wrote several books, they still write several books about Indigos. And our favorite research tool, Google, Bing, and Yahoo. You, know, you just write that, you get all the information, and you try to make sense of everything that is coming. Again, the way I tried to put here was getting all of this and try to make sense and seeing the ones in favor and the, word, the ones against it and see how they would connect. So what I showed here is a lot of what I could understand that Spiritium sees those kids that are arriving here or those kids that look different. If you think they're kids, Indigo, there's one thing. If you think they're kids, someone that reincarnated that you know from other times, they can't be the same thing. <laughs> But whatever it is, you have to try to look at your kid as not necessarily what worked for me is going to work for them. Always. I have to look this way. Sometimes you need to change the method that you're educating them. Right? We are all parents, uh, all of us that are friends here, you have to pay attention to this. With this, I end this talk. I really appreciate your time, your attention.